we're live. And week number five, we're going to finish up chapter four. They're no longer matching up the weeks, and I knew that was going to happen right about this time. Because chapter four is probably the most difficult chapter that we're covering. Okay, so once we get through chapter four, it's a breeze to the end. Okay? Except for antennas. Antennas aren't too bad. They're not too we, we can make sure that it's not too bad for you. And then once we start putting them up, it'll really make sense uh, for you, Howard. And tonight we're going to be starting out with basic components. That is what we are going to be talking about. And uh, if it gets uh, confusing, that's okay. I get confused. So, but we've got folks around here that will help unconfuse me. My wife will do that. Uh, Randy and Lee will do that. And you all will do that as well. Okay. So three of the most basic components. Any idea what they might be? How about resistors? Designated with an R. Makes sense, right? They resist the flow of electricity and they're measured in ohms. Upside down horseshoe. That's the way I look at it anyway. That's an ohms. That's some Greek symbol, I think. That's the omega symbol. There you go. There you go. Okay. Another component, a capacitor. Designated with a C. These store electricity and they're me measured in farads. Okay. And then the third one, an inductor. Designated L. Don't ask me. But they're designated L. They store magnetic energy. Okay? Where is it? Oh. It's on the floor. Oh. <coughs> oh, I know why it's L. <laughs> because I was taken. <laughs> yeah, probably that too. Uh, it's in honor of Heinrich Lentz. Okay, it's in honor of Heinrich Lentz. Lentz That's, who did a lot of research. He did a lot of research on inductors. Okay. Okay, and so these store magnetic energy. Inductors store magnetic energy. Capacitors store electric energy. Capacitors store electric energy. And the inductors are measured in Henry's. Henry's. So, so if you think of Heinrich Lentz, just <laughs> there's your H2. <laughs> there's your H2. Heinrich Lentz. Henry, Heinrich, Lentz, L. Okay. And that's inductors. Okay, here's some a common schematic symbol for resistors. And we've got different kinds here. We've got fixed, variable, photo, thermistor, temperature. Tapped, adjustable, different kinds of resistors that we might have. Oh, I'd like to add though, you don't need to remember what all of those are, just general shape, it's a zigzag, you know. Yeah, just the zigzag <laughs> okay. yeah. for yeah. resistors. Yeah. So Good. I think, I think tap is on the test. It's an inductor. Well <clears throat> Yeah, well I think there is kind of a loop thing, but but it's just, if you remember the, it's a zigzag, that's good enough. Okay. For capacitors, okay? Different kinds of capacitors. Fixed, polarized, feed-through, variable, electrolytic, or whatever. Uh, yeah, I'm not doing good too. Exactly. That's what I meant. You guys are doing much better than I do. We need to get you up here teaching. Yes, we do. Okay, so notice the shape. Something that uh, is common, right? It looks like a backward C. Yeah. Backward C? Yeah. Or, yeah, so some, some of them look like a C. Actually. Some of them do. Those are our But anyway, there's a C shape. Um, All right. On most of them. Capacitors. So are capacitors, um, do they have to be put a certain way into the circuit board? Lee. No, I didn't raise my hand. I said I don't know. 
Oh. <laughs> I heard, I saw the hand go up. I thought that was the answer. It says fixed and non-polarized, so that's what I was asking. You know, that's... Hey, Chad. I would guess by the symbol, if you're looking at the C, it's... Capacitors, when you put them in a circuit board, do they need to be in a certain direction? Uh, depending on the type of capacitor, electrolytic ones need it. So that one in the bottom corner there, the plus indicator. You normally will know because it has a longer lead on it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yep. That help? Yeah. All right. See, I told you we have people around here that have the answers. All right. And then we got inductors. Air core adjustable, non-iron FRC, air, ferret bead. Okay, all kinds of inductors, but what is a common thread in most of these? The loops. <laughs> the loops. Some of them, this couple of them don't have, but for the most part, you've got these, these M's, you know, M, 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 M. Okay. Okay, so tubes, uh, different kinds of tubes, different kinds of schematics. Okay. Wiring, if you've ever looked at wiring diagrams. Different kinds of wiring. So let's talk a little bit about resistors and resistance. Okay, there's several common types of resistors. And I've got some up here on a board that you can hardly see. These little, little tiny things, right? They're bigger up here on the board. But these are some kinds that you're going to see going into a circuit board. All of this stuff's going to go on a circuit board. But these are different kinds of resistors. So you've got uh, available with nominal values from 1 ohm to less or less to more than 1,000 ohms. It's a mega ohm. Okay, that's a mega ohm. I'm going back to my count, accounting days and I'm looking at an M. You're, but you're right, that's mega ohm. So you can get these uh, resistors in all kinds of sizes. And the nominal value is printed with text or colored bands. So you see these colored bands on here? That'd be an indicator of the... Uh, the value of these resistors. Or it could be printed on here. We see this one that's printed. We see print it printing on here, right? Okay. So there's all kinds of resistors. So the most common units are ohms, kilo ohms, or mega ohms. Okay, they have precision tolerance ranges from 1% or less to 10%. Okay, so they can be Fairly precise. Now, if we have to convert between units, uh, if we have to uh, go from ohms to kilo ohms to mega ohms, um, you pass. Just do the worksheet. <laughs> there's some uh, there's some homework on here on how to convert those, and uh, you can see you divide by a million. You do yep. As long as you. Knowing your head, what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. So there's some conversions. An example: 150 ohms. 150 divided by a thousand gives you 0.15 kilo ohms. 150 ohms is, uh, you know, if you take 150 ohms and you divide it by a million, you get 0 0.00015 mega ohms. Okay. So, math. Kind of what we covered last week, math, yeah, sometimes I'm with you, and I'm a bean counter. Give me a 10 key, and add and subtract numbers, I can do that. Some algebra if I have to. That's why I did not keep with going into engineering when I was in college. Here's another example to go the other direction. Yeah, what? Oh, I was 
I was just going to say on the page on the the ones that have to do with test questions, I put them in bold. <laughs> so, so there's some that have to do with test questions in this handout that Penny gave you. Yeah. They are bolded. Yeah. So those are the ones that will be actual test questions out of the test bank. Okay. The others are practice, but the ones that have the bold, make sure you can do those and then you'll be fine. Now, if you take these home and you can't do them this week, come bring them back next week and Penny will answer those for you. Thank you, Penny. Because Penny will answer them. <laughs> Inductors and inductance. Okay. So here's some examples of inductors and inductance. They're like resistors. There's several common types. The double lines indicate a solid magnetic core. Okay. Variable inductors often, often have solid cores. They use double lines or on schematics is optional. Miniature inductors not shown look similar to resistors. Okay, what do you notice about these? They're wound. They're wound. Yeah. Randy brought in a bunch of windings. We're going to talk a little bit about windings tonight, but we've got all kinds of them. These are wound on toroids. Okay. This is a uh, non-magnetic core. Okay. And uh, you've got wiring that is uh, ceramic based I can't remember what what it's made out of but I know it has a ceramic covering on it. And is it different mix? That's a mix 43. They all kinds of different mixes depending on which frequencies you want to uh, uh, work with. Yeah. You can pass that around and take a look at that. But we've got all kinds of, of different ones and we use these to to make antennas, yeah. okay? So, and they're they're fun to build, and you can you can make these, and uh, you can get an antenna to work. I I built one of these using uh, in this inductors, right? Get it wound. You hook up some wire to it, send it up to a tree, down to a fence, and talk all over the world with it on something that I made. Holy moly, it actually works. So you can get a lot of satisfaction from, uh, from building things. And so these are some of the concepts that we want to know in order to do that. Okay. You know, another concept you can look at is, okay, you got this round thing, I put wire around it and I put another wire on it and I can talk, essentially. But what it is is, you know, this stuff, inductors. Inductor design. Inductant, inductance is the ability to store magnetic energy is directly propor proportional to the square of the number of turns and area enclosed by each turn. Making an inductor longer without changing the number of turns or diameter reduces inductance. Okay. Sounds Greek to me. Does it sound Greek to anybody else? Yep, yep, okay. So, if you notice as this thing, this uh, toroid comes around, there's a number of turns on it, right? On the 9 to 1 that's going around, that's a 9 to 1, right? That's a 4 to 1? 4 to 1. The black one is a 9 to 1? The black one is a 9 to 1. These are 49 to 1, and there's 17 oh, turns. That, that's a 1 to 1. That, well, that, yeah, that is a 1. And the orange one is a 49 to 1. This is a 49 to 1. There should be 13 turns on these. I think so, yeah. Plus two uh, primaries, and the rest are secondaries. Yep. Mm -hmm. So there's 13 turns, and they're going two different directions, believe it or not. Did you, make this right? you can pass that one around, that one too. I did not. So what frequencies would you use that one for? On a 49? Uh, goes, uh, from, uh, I think those are from 80 up through 6. Yeah. I think these are 65 feet long. If you want to get one uh, 60, you got to go to 135 feet. Lee runs uh, primary 9 to 1 on his, and he talks the world with that random wire. And that's like the black one. That's the random. Yeah. So you, different windings 
as, you know, it changes that inductance. And that's what changes the frequencies that you can, uh, you can work. As far as the transformers go, you want to get the ohms down to 50 ohms. Modern transceivers like to see 50 ohms, right? Yes. So a long wire at the far end is about 2,000 ohms. That transformer brings it down to 50, so it matches it to your ring. Yeah. And so as you, as you think about your coax cable, you're wanting coax cable that is 50 ohm coax because it matches with your radio. And then you get with these inductors it'll, and transformers, this is a transformer, and what it does is it brings that inductance down to match with your radio. Okay, so that's what this is doing. Okay, so increasing the ability to store magnetic energy is called permeability and it increases the inductance. So the more magnetic energy you can store, the more inductance that you have, okay? Oh, sorry. Did you get it? Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Lee. Typically, um, is the whole assembly called the ballon, and the parts of the ballon are what we're talking about here? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So this is the ballon. The whole thing is the ballon. And then it's capped and ready to go. Or on on. L on or on on. Yep. Balanced, unbalanced. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So inductor design continued. The type of core and windings affects inductance and vary according to the use and purpose of the inductor. So you can get different inductors, inductors for different purposes, right? And variable inductors are often used in low power receiving and transmitting applications. Okay. And they're adjusted by moving a magnetic core in and out of the inductor. Threaded cores move when turned. So one of those examples back there looked like it was lots of windings on it. I should have brought my uh, wolf. Because that is a good example of that. I've got it out in the car. I should have grabbed it. But it looks like a threaded thing. And there's actually on one of my antennas, you just move a collar down and you can change the frequencies that you're dealing with because it changes where that winding is. Okay? The manual tuner has variable coils in it. Manual tuner has variable coils. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Definitely makes sense. Okay. For high-powered inductors, adjustment is made by moving a sliding contact along the inductor. And this is what my Wolf River coil does. Because I'm moving it up and down. Click, 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 click. And you'll see, you'll see that uh, on a lot of antennas. Okay, converting between units. Here we go again. Same principle. Okay, same principles. You've got nano Henry's, you've got micro Henry's, and you've got millihenries. And well, it's just lots of Henry's. Okay, you've got micro Henry's, you can go to nano Henry's. It's the same principle, and it's in your handout. Example 330 divided by 1000 equals 0.33. And this is the. Uh, designation, My, micro Henry, nano Henry. Another example. And another example. Lots of examples. You can divide, you can multiply, go back and forth. Okay, inductor coupling. So you place two inductors close together with axis aligned. So you got a couple of inductors here, close together. They're aligned, right? 
The magnetic field from one inductor can also pass through the second one so that you're, you end up, you see how this field is coming? Here's your magnetic field, right? You got one coming from this one, you got one coming this way, and they share. They share. So it shares some of its energy, and it's called coupling. And the ability of inductors to share or transfer magnetic energy is called mutual inductance. Okay. So when you see these red words, that would you want to keep those in mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to be key for the test. Okay, as we continue. Toroid winding, the toroidal, I'm just keeping with toroid winding. The core contains nearly all the inductors. Winding the core contains nearly all the inductors' magnetic field. Since little of the field extends outside of the core, toroids can be placed next to each other in almost any orientation with minimal mutual inductance. Okay, they can be pretty close together and not really impact one another. This property makes them useful in RF circuits. So you can get an RF circuit like that uh, board that I passed around somewhere. And... Uh, or did I pass? No, I didn't pass it around. It's right here. Okay. But you can have, you can put a couple of toroids on one of these boards close together and it's not really going to impact one another. Okay. You can put them in one of these boxes. You might have a couple of them. I haven't seen that design, but I might work on that design. There's probably one out there. But that's useful in RF circuits. And the composition of the core varies. You can have ferrite. You can have powder, powdered iron. Even exotic rare earth metals in these round toroids, okay? And it's a composition that you might have a certain percentage of one metal, you might have something else put together. So you can get a wide range of inductance and values in, re in a relatively small package. So these are very handy when it comes to getting that inductance. The combination of materials is the mix in the core, and it's selected so that the inductor performs best over a specific range of frequencies. Okay, as, as Randy had mentioned, some of these are, you know, 9 to 1, 4 to 1, 49 to 1. They're going to be good over different kinds of frequencies. And there are charts out there to show you, okay, this 4 to 1, you can use it on these frequencies if you use this length of wire and couple it with it. And uh, so this, this is what really makes it exciting to try to build these antennas. Am I using the right thing? Am I winding it the right way? Do I have the right length of wire? Do my, is my wire too long by two inches? You know, how am I going to know? Well, you, you test them and see how your, your uh, SWR is. And we'll talk about standing wave ratio. And uh, so there's a couple of things that you want to find out is your, where's your inductance, right? And you see just how it's going to work for you. Okay, let's see how we're, uh, how we're doing. Practice questions. What is an advantage of using a ferrite core toroidal inductor? Large values of inductance may be obtained. Magnetic properties of the core may be optimized for a specific range of frequencies. Most of the magnetic field is contained in the core, or all of these choices are correct. What do you think? D. D is what I'm hearing? I would have to agree. It's a good thing I agreed before it popped up, right? Yeah. I'm not going to do that on all of them. Okay. What determines the performance of a ferrite core at different frequencies? Its conductivity, its thickness, the composition or mix of materials used, the ratio of the outer diameter to the inner diameter. C. C, the composition of the mixture. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's talk a little bit about capacitors and capacitance. So capacitors have two conducting surfaces. They're electrodes separated by dielectric. Okay? So two conducting surfaces, electrodes, which are separated by 
dielectric. I got a couple of capacitors on here. Can you see them? Rick, can you see those capacitors on there? All six of them? Yeah, okay, there's not six of them on there. There's only two. They're the orange ones. They're the orange ones. They kind of look like these up here, okay? Capacitors. And what do capacitors do? Store, Store right? Store electricity. Capacitor, capacitance is the ability to store, to store electric energy, and it's married. Okay, let's. <laughs> it's measured in farads. Okay, measured in farads. It blocks DC current flow. Okay. The simplest capacitor is a pair of metal plates separated by air. Okay. All right. Somebody want to read that? Because I can't read. Penny, why don't you read that for us? Me? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I forgot. Tantalum electrolytic capacitors are polarized, meaning the DC voltage may only be applied in one direction without damaging the electrolyte. Check polarity markings for correct installation. Okay. Tantalum and ele <coughs> electro... Thank you. Are polarized. These capacitors are polarized, okay? The voltage may, the DC voltage may only be applied in one direction, one direction, without damaging the electro electrolytic. I give up. <laughs> Electrolyte, yeah. And you want to check the polarization on these. Okay, you want to make sure they're going the right way. Capacitors have voltage ratings. Exceeding this rating can result in arcing between conducting surfaces. And it usually destroys all but air dielectric, dielectric capacitors, okay? So you want to make sure you watch those voltage ratings. You don't want to be outside of that. You don't want to exceed that. You don't want an arcing between conducting surfaces. That would not be a good thing. Would it, Brian? Brian's an electrician. I learned that tonight. He's a fireman, he's an electrician, he's a jack of all trades and master of many, right? Just one. Just one? <laughs> all right. Okay, so capacitor types. We've got ceramic. These are RF filtering, bypassing at high frequencies, and they have a low cost. They have a low cost. Ceramic, they have a low cost. Okay. CC. CC. They're cheap. <laughs> They're cheap. Ceramic is cheap. Okay, remember that. Okay, plastic film used in audio circuits and lower radio frequencies. Silver mica, silvered mica, highly stable, low loss used in RF circuits. Electrolytic and tantalum. Power supply filter circuits, okay. If you've got a power supply, you're probably going to have some of these in it. Air and vacuum dielect dielectric, yeah. Transmitting and RF circuits. And what are they used for? Okay. They're used for blocking. Right? They pass AC signals while blocking DC signals. They bypass. They provide low impedance path for AC signals around higher impedance circuit. They filter, smooth out voltage pulses of rectified AC to even DC voltage. They're a suppressor. 
absorb energy of voltage transients or spikes. And for tuning, they vary frequency of resonant circuits or adjust impedance matching circuits. So they're used for a number of things, aren't they? Capacitors can be in a lot of different parts. Okay, aluminum and tantalum. Uh, ele Electrolytic. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know what it is with my mouth tonight. It's not. This is not communicating with this. Capacitors. It's got to be a Monday. Is that Monday? <laughs> All right. Designed to optimize their energy storage capabilities. Voltage must be applied with the correct polarity. Okay. This is what we talked about. If it's going the wrong way, <laughs> not a good thing, right? You want the voltage going the right direction. It creates large capacitances in comparatively small volumes. Okay. And aluminum uses metal foiled for conductive surfaces and dielectric is an insulating layer on the foil created by a wet paste or gel. Wow. And tantalum is similar to aluminum in that a porous mass of tantalum is immersed in an electrolyte. Okay. Okay, let's, let's get on to the good stuff now, the practice questions. What is the value in nanofarads of a 22,000 picofarad capacitor? Uh, C22. Okay, I hear C22. Anybody have something else they want to say? It is C22. Howard has got this down. All right. What is the value of microfarads of a 4,700 nanofarad capacitor? I'm hearing B. D. D. 4.7? Moving three places. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Line is an advantage, an advantage of an electrolytic capacitor. Tight tolerance, much less leakage than the other type. High capacitance for a given volume, inexpensive RF capacitor. C. C. High capacitance for a given volume. Yes, that's correct. Which of the following is an advantage of the ceramic capacitors? Same question. C. 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 Right? Oh, so cheap. Ceramic cheap. Yeah, so it's cheap. cheap. Comparative low cost. That's a good way to remember that one. I, I didn't do, have that in my mind when I took this test. So that is a good way to remember it. I like that. CC. Ceramic capacitors cheap. Okay. Very good. All right. Transformers. Jeff, just a... Yes. Capacitors can hold their charge for a long time. They can. Yes. Ask Chad. <laughs> yes. We had some capacitors in the back room that are about this big, and he went to pick them up, and that was not a good thing to do. Took a zap? Yes, that good. We used to do that back in physics class in high school. Our teacher taught us his old a Model A little coils. You could charge them up, and you set them on a the table. Somebody could make a gravel, you know, and light them right up. <laughs> that was the funniest thing we ever saw. <laughs> Did you think it was funny when Chad grabbed him? No, 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 def definitely not when it's carrying a lot of juice. So you definitely want to be ca careful of those. And they, they were years old that had been sitting back there, many, many really? years that they, they'd been sitting there. And, and they got zapped really good. Yeah, they'll, they'll hold their charge. The standard wow. was always to uh, discharge them before you get the store on them. How do you and do that? Grab it up. And that was that was the whole point behind this. You know. Yeah. Yep. It's a good way to good way to remember that they do store that energy, and that's one of the things we'll talk about in in sa the safety part of uh, of our class too. Maybe before that, I think we talked about it a little bit tonight. Transformers transfer AC power between two or more inductors called windings, sharing a common core. Okay. So you got a transformer. I didn't. I didn't bring one. Power supply is a transformer. Okay, you plug it into the wall, right? Your radio is 
takes DC power, 12.8 volts. 13.8. Yeah, I'd give up tonight. <laughs> you hear of a 12 volt battery, right? Think of that, 13.6 volts is what it gives out to your radio. That's what your radios require. That, that's what makes them happy, okay? Like you can't take your radio and plug it directly into the wall. Unhappy. Unhappy radio. Never to work again radio, okay? So it has to go through a transformer. It has to take the power coming out of the wall and transform it, hence the word, into something that the radio is happy with, okay? And so a transformer transfers that AC power between two or more inductors called windings sharing a common core. The winding to which the power is applied is the primary. Okay? So in these windings that you see on that uh, toroid that we passed around, one of those is a primary where the power is applied. Okay? The other is called... The secondary, which is the winding from which the power is supplied to the secondary. The winding from which power is supplied is the secondary. Okay, so you're getting primary, you get a secondary. To and from. Winding to which, the, which power is applied is the primary. Winding from which power is supplied is the secondary. And if that doesn't confuse you, I don't know what will. But just remember, to and from, primary and secondary. When voltage is applied to primary, mutual inductance causes voltage, is, voltage to appear across the secondary. And transformers can work in both directions. Okay? So if you've ever... What do they call that... Uh, when you go from DC to AC. Rectifier. Rectifier. You plug it. Re rectifier is AC to DC, so you wanted a, a converter. Converter. Yep, that's what I'm thinking. Converter. So you get a converter. You plug, you hook it up to a, a 12 volt battery, your car battery. And uh, it's an inverter, isn't it? And then you can plug into it with an AC appliance okay so it can go both ways it can go from AC to DC DC to AC okay transformers can transform in either direction transformers change power from one combination combination of AC voltage and current to another by using windings with different numbers of turns the transformation occurs because all windings share the same magnetic field wound on the same core. And a significant change between secondary and primary usually requires a change in the wire size between the windings. And in step-up transformers, the primary carries higher current and is wound with a larger diameter wire than the secondary. Okay, so if you're going to step your current up, you're going to have a couple of different size wires that are, are in that winding. All right. Transformer math. One of our favorite terms. Math, math, math. The number of turns in the primary winding, N, number of turns in the primary, to the number of turns in the secondary, number of turns in the secondary, determines how current and voltage are changed. Since most circuits are concerned with voltage, most transformer equations relate the transformer input, the primary voltage, which is voltage primary to output secondary, voltage secondary, okay? And this is the equation. E, S, which is voltage secondary divided by voltage primary equals the winding secondary divided by the windings primary. <laughs> or moving it around. I, I think the important thing is just to remember that everything's proportional. So no matter how many windings you have on each one, just remember that the 
Yeah, the voltage compared to the windings is going to be the same on both. Yep. So. so as your windings go up, your voltage goes up on each, on the secondary. Okay. Here are some examples. I think Penny gave you some examples of this. Oh, well, I can pass it out. <laughs> pass it out. These are just the two questions that are on the test that I, yeah. These are the ones you just need to make sure you know. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, Remember the ones she's passing out. Okay. All right. So the answer to this one is 120 times 0 0.222 or 26.7 volts. And we're going to go through this kind of quick to get to the practice questions. All right, what causes a voltage to appear across a secondary winding of a transformer when an AC voltage source is connected across the primary winding? Is this capacitive coupling, displacement current coupling, mutual inductance, All right, it is mutual inductance C is what I'm hearing. All right, very good. What happens if a signal is applied to a secondary winding of a 4 to 1 voltage step-down transformer instead of the primary winding? The output voltage is multiplied by 4. The output voltage is divided by 4. Additional resistance must be added in series with the primary to prevent overload, or additional resistance must be added to the parallel, in parallel with the secondary to prevent overload. Hey, Howard has been studying. I like that, Howard. You're ready to take this test, aren't you? <laughs> I thought so. Okay, what is the RMS voltage across a 500 turn secondary winding in a transformer? If the 2250 turn primary is connected to 120 volts AC. Okay. And this is the one that the handout has. C. Yeah, C. C. Okay. <clears throat> okay, this is on your handout, okay? And it is C. <laughs> well, but what confused me is that it uses that RMS voltage because, you know. Because we're not computing the RMS voltage for the 120 volts, so. But it's just like, okay, just forget about that. And just forget about that for yeah, this right. one. Yeah, right, okay. So, so that's why I have that little thing in there, because I'm confused, but you can ignore that. All right, why is the, okay, why is the conductor of the primary winding of many voltage step-up transformers larger in diameter than the conductor of the secondary winding? I'll let you read through these. I agree. Okay. <laughs> B. <laughs> All right, Howard. Howard's on. A, Howard, you need to make sure you join us on the uh, Wednesday night at uh, Skeeter Net when we go through all these questions. <laughs> okay, components in serial and in series and parallel circuits. Okay. So. What are these? Resistors. Resistors, all right. And so as we see here, we got a resistor, and they're all coming this way, right? Parallel. They're parallel. How about over here? We're coming off of here. Here's our power supply, right? Our battery. Plus it's flowing this way, and it's flowing this way. Well, it's flowing this way. What? We got these in series, don't we? One after another. Okay. In series circuits, the current is the same in all components, and voltages are summed. This is Kirchhoff's voltage law. So voltages add in series in a series circuit. In parallel circuits, which is different, voltage across all components is the same. 
and the sum of currents into and out of circuits must be equal. Currents add in a parallel circuit. Okay, so here's your difference. Currents add in a parallel circuit where voltages add in a series circuit. If you remember that, you'll be okay on the test. Okay, voltages add in a series, currents add in a parallel. I memorized that one. Uh -huh. Thank you. Because I kept screwing it up. So I had to memorize it. Components connected in series or parallel can be replaced with a single equivalent component. Okay. Calculating series and parallel equivalent values. Okay, so if we have a resistor in series, you're going to add the values of R1, R2, and R3. In inductor, you're going to add L1, L2, and L3, etc. In a capacitor, it's the reciprocal of reciprocals. So how does the total current relate to the individual currents in each branch of a purely resistive parallel circuit. Any idea? A. a. I agree with you. It equals the average of each branch current. No. I'm surprised it's right. <laughs> yes. C. It equals the sum of the currents through each branch. Okay, so. This is a parallel circuit, right? All right. Which of the following components increases the total resistance of a resistor? A parallel resistor, a series resistor, a series capacitor, a parallel capacitor. Now we're going to increase the uh, total resistance here. What do you think? Okay, so we've got a got a resistor. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Remember, stay with the normals. Resistors are normal, so stay. <laughs> yeah. It is B. So, yeah. Yep. You're gonna need to series that are added series. together, yeah. right? Can I sit by you during the test? No. <laughs> <laughs> what is the total resistance of three 100 ohm resistors in parallel? Well, we just did the C. C. Yeah. It is C. Yeah. By <laughs> if three equal value resistors in series produce 450 ohms, what is the value of each resistor? C. C. Yeah, just 450 divided by three, right? What is the equivalent capacitance of two 5.0 nanofarad capacitors and one 750 picofarad capacitors connected in parallel? But this is one where you have ca capacitance and parallel together. So, so you just do simple, they act normal because you just, yeah, it's just simple addition. D. 10.750 nanofarads. Okay, what is the capacitance of three 100 microfarad capacitors connected in series? Point three three. Point three three. Oh, okay. Thirty three point three. That's the answer to the next question. <laughs> 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 okay, the next question is B. Uh, what is the inductance of three ten millihenry inductors connected in parallel? I want to I want to mess you up here, Howard. I, I'm not trying to mess you up. Though. This one is the what is the inductance of three 10 millihenry inductors connected in parallel? I'm going to go. 
3.3 millihenry C? Yeah. That is correct. Okay, what is the inductance of a 20 millihenry inductor connected in series with a 50 millihenry inductor? Okay, and these are ones that you can add because it's series and inductor. So you're saying C. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. C, okay, all right. What is the capacitance of a 20 microfarad capacitor connected in series with a 50 microfarad capacitor? B. Yep. And which of the following components should be added to a capacitor to increase the capacitance? An inductor in series, a resistor in series, a capacitor in parallel, a capacitor in series. C. C. A capacitor in parallel. Yep. Good, good. Oh, we're not all done yet, huh? Which of the following components should be added to an inductor to increase inductance? A capacitor in series, a resistor in parallel, an inductor in parallel, an inductor in series. What do you think? You want to try D? Yes. Okay, the answer is D. Correct, Amando. What is the total resistance of a 10 ohm, a 20 ohm, and a 50 ohm resistor connected in parallel? Okay, I'm getting A and D. It is A, 5.9 ohms. Okay, now we go on to reactants. Reactants, resistance to the flow of AC current caused by capacitance or inductance, denoted by X, measured in ohms, like resistance. Capacitive reactance is a opposition to AC current flow from the stored energy in a capacitor denoted X subscript C. And capacitors behave with differently with AC and DC current. With DC, when voltage is initially applied, capacitors look like a short circuit. After charging, it looks like an open circuit. This is how it blocks DC signals. AC behavior depends upon voltage frequency. Yeah. We'll talk more about this in the extra class. Yeah, we'll get more into this in extra. It builds, the extra builds upon this class. So, yeah. All right, so capacitive reactants. So we got time cruising along this axis, right? We got voltage coming across the capacitor here. So as the voltage increases with time, the capacitive reactance climbs, doesn't it? Then it gets to a point where it doesn't climb much more. Now, current through a capacitor comes the other way. Okay, reduces that capacitive reactance. And this is the formula for it, 1 over 2 pi Fc. You got a handout for that one? For what? For this one. No, I didn't need to do one because there's no questions on that. There's no <laughs> questions on that in the test, so yeah. don't worry about that one. The inductive reaction is the opposition to AC current flow from stored energy in an, an, a inductor and is denoted by XL. And that's the formula. There's no test questions on that. There's no test questions on that. Parasitic inductance. Parasitic. Keep, what is a parasite? Do you want parasites around? Not usually. A parasite is something that's kind of just, ugh, right? So a parasitic, an unwanted characteristic resulting from the component's physical construction. For example, coils in a wire wound, in coils in wire wound resistors. Coils create parasitic inductance, okay? Wire leads of components. 
In inductors, each pair of turns creates parasitic capacitance in series with inductance. And often significant enough to disrupt, disrupt circuits operation or affect tuning in radios. Reactants. What do we think here? Opposition to flow of direct current caused by resistance. Opposition to the flow of alternating current caused by capacitance or inductance. A properly property of ideal resistors and AC circuits. A large spark produced at switch contacts. No? Okay, so so we're talking about B here, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Which of the following causes opposition to the flow of alternating current in an inductor? I, did I hear B? D. D, okay. I was going to say reluctance. Uh, I might be reluctant for some things, but I can't speak and I can't hear either, so we're, we're doubly troubled tonight. Which of the following causes opposition to the flow of alternating current in a capacitor? D, again. Okay. The there is an error in this. Ignore this, okay? Uh, this has been tested by the tester here. She's gone back to the source document. The answer to this is reactants, okay? What does the, what does the uh, test come up with? Does the test come up with the wrong answer as well? No, the test has the right answer. It's just the wrong answer on this slide. Okay. It's just on this slide that was put together by an individual that got the wrong answer. He made a mistake. I think he changed. So, so Penny's going to reach out to him so he can correct his slides. Okay, how does an inductor react to AC? Okay, as the frequency of the AC, applied AC increases... Okay, think about this. Is applied, the reactance decreases? The amplitude of the applied AC increases? The reactance increases? The amplitude of the applied AC increases? The reactance decreases? Or as the frequency of the applied AC increases? Okay, I'm hearing A, I'm hearing D, and the correct answer is delta okay frequency and reactants both increase yeah. yeah the way I like to think of it is well inductor, inductors to me are normal they increase when the frequency does so. okay <clears throat> how does a capacitor react to AC the goes the opposite so as frequency increases, reactance decreases. decreases A. Okay. What unit is used to measure reactance? B ohms. Yes, it's B ohms. Which of the following is a reason not to use wire wound resistors in an RF circuit? Let's see. The resistors could overheat. B? D? B, Bravo. Bravo, the resistors inductions could make circuit performance unpredictable. I think that's it. Yeah. Good. And impedance. I can't read up there anymore. I'm going to read over here. I don't know why I've been doing it. Shaking my head. Turn my head all night. Okay, impedance is the opposition to current flow in an AC circuit caused by resistance. Reaction, reactance, or any combination of the two denoted by Z measured in ohms, okay? Like resistance, it's the ratio of voltage to current. Okay, and here's our figure, right? Z equals voltage to current, 250 to 2 amps. 125 ohms. Okay, an example. Resonance. Resonance is a condition in which there is a match between the frequency at which the circuit or antenna naturally responds to the frequency 
of an applied signal. We want resonance, okay? That's what we want. We want our antennas resonant so that we can have that right frequency and it talks to our radios nicely, okay? That's where we really apply that. And this occurs when a capacitive and inductive reactants are equal. So you want the reactants and the capacitive e reactants equal. We don't want them to be one higher, one lower. We want them to be a match. And you'll often hear that, you know, I'm resonant when I'm at a match. In a resonant series circuit, reactants of L and C cancel, making it the short circuit, leaving only resistant as the circuit's impedance. These are used in filter and tuned circuits to pass or reject specific frequencies. All right, resonant series circuits. In a resonant series circuit, the reactants of L and the reactants of C cancel, making a short circuit. This leaves only the resistance as the circuit's impedance. It's in red, okay? It's in red. Kind of remember this. Self-resonance is... Uh, it can occur when a component's expected reactance equals the reactance of its parasitic reactants. And results in a component that appears to be a short or open circuit at self-resonant frequency. Above this frequency, the component's reactance switches tight, making an inductor capacitive and a capacitor inductive. They flip. Impedance transformation. A transformer can change between the combination of voltage and current while transferring energy. And a transformer also changes impedance between the primary and secondary circuits by changing the ratio of voltage and current between the primary and secondaries. And the turn ratio controls the transformation in the same way as ratio of gear teeth in a mechanical transmission. Okay. And here's the formula and once again it's a, uh, a ratio. Okay. Just some examples. Some more examples. Impedance matching. An energy source's ability to deliver power to a load is limited by its internal impedance. Amateur transmitting equipment is designed so that it has that internal impedance at 50 ohms. Okay, 50 ohms, that's a key number that you're always going to remember in, in amateur radio. If, a if the difference between the antenna system impedance and the transmitter output, out impedance is great enough, the transmitter may reduce power to avoid damage. So if you're, you're going to hear, if your SWR is not right, you're, it's not making your radio happy, and your radio is going to start putting out less power, because it's not happy, okay? So I want to I wanna go out there and I want to transmit at 100 watts, okay? I want to get my signal out there. Well, if I don't have a good match, it isn't going to happen. I mean, it's not going to go out with 100 watts. It's going to start cutting back because it, it can't, it can't exceed that if you've got a mismatch. And most impedance matching circuits are LC circuits. Most impedance matching circuits are LC circuits, inductors and capacitors. So you've got uh, inductors here and capacitors, right? Here's your inductors, right? Here's your capacitors, inductors, and capacitors. So impedance matching can also be performed by special lengths of connections of transmission lines, okay? So if you've got, you're trying to match your impedance and your connection line is long, you're gonna have trouble, right? So you've got to make sure you're getting a good match there. Sometimes you have to go up to a higher uh, thickness of cable 
if you're going out with a very long run of R58, you're going to have problems where LMR400, which is a thicker coax cable, it's going to not going to have as much loss. Okay, you're going to have a better match. Okay, what is impedance? No, C. C. Yeah, I'm going to let you read these. What happens when the impedance of an electrical load is equal to the output impedance of a power source, assuming both impedances are resistive? D. D, correct. One reason to use an impedance matching transformer to minimize transmitter output power? No. To maximize transfer power, mm -hmm. B, yeah. Which of following devices can be used for impedance matching at radio frequencies? B. Sure. Oh, C. Oh, wait a minute. D. Oh, I think D. D. It is D. All of those can. A transformer, a Pi network, and the length of transmission wire can all impact that. Which of the following describes one method of impedance matching between two AC circuits? A. Okay. LC. 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 It is A. Okay. What is the turn ratio of a transformer used to match an audio amplifier having 600 ohms of output impedance to a speaker having 4 ohms impedance? Well, this is on the handout too. This is on the handout too? Mm -hmm. huh? I think it's A. You think it's A? You're right, Howard. <laughs> You've been doing good studying, Howard. I like that. Yeah. Do you, you don't want to talk about how to do it. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> what happens when <laughs> what happens when an inductor is operated above its self resonant frequency? It becomes Charlie. It becomes a Charlie horse? It becomes capacitive, yeah, it flips, then it. All right, hallelujah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're done with this section. <laughs>